Today, we're talking about orchids. That plant family that has captivated naturalists since Charles Darwin. Orchidaceae is a large plant family. There's still well over 25,000 species globally, and they come in every colour, form, and size that you could think of. Orchids have a reputation for being one of the most difficult plant groups to propagate and return to the wild. Because of some very unique requirements. The first is habitat. Thelemitra epipactoides, or the metallic sun orchid, occurs in a range of habitats across Victoria, Australia. But in East Gippsland, it has a very specific habitat. It occurs in an ecotone between Ceylon wetlands grading into Banksy woodlands. And even within that ecotone, it occurs on slight rises. So the places where it did occur was really limited. On top of that, the wild population was facing many threats. It's a highly palatable, highly visible species. The population were being overrun by deer. The wild population was well known to naturalists, all wanting to look at Australia's largest sun orchid, but sadly trampling it in the process. This niche habitat made it incredibly challenging to find a suitable planting location for a conservation population. That was until Gippsland Water volunteered. They had this ecotone. How lucky. And they said, yeah, you can plant there. And yeah, we'll build the fence. So we had to set up an enclosure, excluding all the sorts of things that like to eat orchids on occasion. We put in 192, I think we put in. And in 2019, we had 165 plants re-emerge. And in 2020, we had 162 plants re-emerge. The next achievement we'd like to see is, is recruitment. Even though the team were lucky in finding the right location, it still took around 22 years of surveys and research to plan this project. And this is because where to put orchids is only one part of the puzzle. Orchids have very specialised propagation and pollination requirements. Dr Nushka Raita has experience of over 50 orchid translocations and has been world leading, unravelling the mysteries of this plant family. Basically, um, all of our terrestrial orchids are reliant on mycorrhizal fungi in order to germinate in the wild. Mycorrhizal fungi live within and around the roots of most plants providing mutual benefits of food and chemical signalling. But for orchids, these fungi are highly specialised. And the seeds do not have their own food reserve, known as endosperm. Instead, they rely on fungi for energy to germinate and grow. Providing that the mycorrhizal fungi wasn't there, then they wouldn't survive and they wouldn't be able to recruit. One of the species that Nushka has provided groundbreaking research on is Caledonia colorata. It's a gorgeous little spider orchid. It's uh, nationally endangered. And we were able to discover that, that there wasn't that many species that they associated with. Having identified our mycorrhizal fungi, we'll then use that in the propagation of the species. Nushka and the team also looked at the distribution of this mycorrhizal fungi across Southern Australia. So there's lots of other Caledonia species out there that are more common that um, in some cases share the mycorrhizal fungi with these rare species. It's really helpful to have indicator species when you're choosing your introduction sites. An orchid's relationship with its pollinator or pollinators is critical to the orchid's survival. Orchids have some of the most amazing pollination systems in our plant kingdom. 
orchids use a wide variety of complex, highly specialised methods to attract and select the right pollinator. This can be through simple mechanics, the pollinator being the right size for the orchid, or it can be more complicated, such as sexual mimicry, food deception and food rewards. Often when you have these food rewarding systems, there might be several pollinators involved or it might not be specific. Caledonia colorata it was actually the first proof of a food rewarding but specific pollinator relationship. It was just one thin iron wasp that is the right size and the right fit. And this orchid provides a really small amount of nectar on the labellum. That's right, there's only one species of insect that pollinates this orchid. And so this has huge implications for when you are thinking about translocations. So you really need to make sure that the pollinator is present and that you're getting your plants pollinated before you introduce them in large numbers. The detail and attention given to orchid translocations is yielding dividends. They get this attention because the project would fail without it. The populations are self-sustaining, so there are now more, than re more recruits than um, there were plants that were put in there originally. But there's one key thing we haven't addressed. It seems like a huge amount of time, cost and labour for such a niche species with niche relationships. Why not let them go extinct? Orchids represent 16 to 70% of our nationally threatened flora. And so there are a large proportion of our threatened flora. Having a specialised program that helps deal with some of the intricacies of that is really helpful. However, the lessons learned are really applicable to many other threatened flora. It really hasn't been embraced across you know, translocations globally, and it requires quite a lot of work. Many of our Australian flora have specific pollinator associations. The majority of our other plants do have mycorrhizal associations and um, there's been lots of research um, that has shown that with their mycorrhizal fungi, um, they are healthier, more vigorous plants in the wild. If we want to have the best chance of saving threatened flora from extinction, we need to learn from these orchid translocations and understand it takes years of research, planning and dedication in order to successfully save plant species. Music